What's going on everybody? Welcome back to the Eclectic Collector channel. So it has been a while since we did a Let's Review on this channel and it made sense to me to bring back a Let's Review with one for a series that I've been talking about for a pretty long time now on this channel. I did a uh, let's talk about about this series like probably almost almost three years ago at this point. Uh, I also did a why you should read, which has done pretty well for you know as well as the videos on my channel do. And then I did um, I've done two uh, let's reviews, and this is going to be the third let's review. And I've, I've probably done more videos about this uh, series than I've done maybe about anything else that I've talked about on this channel. So uh, so yeah, let's knock out a Let's Review for Volume 6 of Die Dark. And just a heads up, if you haven't read this far into the series, this is going to be full on spoilers for everything that happened in uh, Volume 6 of this manga. And I took a ton of notes. I wrote a lot down so that we could really... Uh, go deep into this one and just kind of continue from where the story left off last time and I know it's been a while since this volume dropped and volume 7 is literally dropping this same month but it made sense to me I guess you know to talk about it right now I wanted to get it out a lot sooner but I just every time I want to do a thing there's like a bunch of other projects that end up getting in the way and I want to get those out and then uh, some projects end up just getting pushed further and further back so Anyway, I think that is enough rambling. Let's get to it. I'm going to show you a bunch of panels. And yeah, this is something that I've been really looking forward to talking about. I love the series. I love Q Hayashi, that's artwork. Let's review Die Dark Volume 6. Where we left off last time on Die Dark Volume 5 is that the gang, Zaha Avakian and Shimada Death, are on planet Kenzarn. Hajime Damemaru has been captured and had his body and head separated into several different jars. We get a pretty entertaining look at his dark paggy Nagarun trying to break the jar with Hajime's head in it by repeatedly smashing it in a comical overhead motion. It's been over a year since my last Dark Dark Let's Review, and one thing that it feels great to return to is Kyu Hayashi does incredible penchant for telling a fun story. Six volumes deep and this series is as entertaining now as it was when I first started reading it three years ago. I've now done like five videos on the series including this one. No matter the span of time away it feels right jumping in and rejoining the adventures of the four little shits Zaha Senko, Shimada Death, Zaha's Paggy Avakian, and Hajime Damimaru, who so yearns to be called Hellmaster. While Nagarun tries to save Hajime Damimaru, Zaha and Shimada Death go their own way to catch up with the Lighthead Order on planet Kenzarn. In the last chapter, they had thrown Shimada in their human form into a chamber that would liquefy them, if I'm not mistaken. Zaha fights off some cronies who try to steal his bones. Since in this world, it is believed that one can use his bones to grant any wish one desires. However, it is them whose bones are instead taken by Zaha, since bones are essentially currency. He can spend the bones with Misatani to get new items or even upgrade a vacuum. Zaha and Shimada Death work their way through the Lighthead Order's followers making their way to the luminary of Kenzarn, who looks like a giant mutated hamster. Zaha and Shimada end up following them into a trap though, and get stuck in a triangle-shaped space. They are immediately hit with a bright light, like a magnifying glass that fries Zaha and Shimada pretty severely. However, Shimada is pretty unbothered by it, taking it in stride. It's Zaha who feels the torture of the light beam attack, and he pretty much just screams in pain while Shimada watches on, unfazed. If it wasn't obvious before, it's definitely clear here. Shimada couldn't care less what happens to anyone, and is just along for the ride. 
One of my favorite things about Die Dark is Shimada Death. I feel like Shimada Death is one of those characters where you really never know where they stand. And it kind of feels like Shimada Death is just there because wherever Zaha goes, like Death, uh, not, not Shimada Death, but just in general, like somebody's going to die. Wherever, like, wherever Zaha Senko and Vakian and whatnot go, like Death just follows this kid around. Literally, you know, because of Shimada Death and then... Because people want his bones, right? Because he is Zaha Senko and his bones, like, supposedly will grant you any wish that you could ever want. So, Shimada Death literally follows, follows him around, I think, for that, that reason. Because when he's put into, like, literal danger, Shimada Death just kind of, like, seems to not be bothered by it. Until Shimada Death remembers that uh, Avakian had asked them to, you know, watch after Zaha. And that's when Shimada Death kind of, like says, oh yeah, I gotta watch over him, you know, otherwise, they would have been completely oblivious to him, and I feel like, yeah, there's a, there's a big part of that where it's just, like, convenience, you know, just being around Zaha because not so much of friendship, or maybe that, maybe partly, you know, because of, of friendship, but more than anything because of convenience, like, wherever he goes, there's bound to be, you know, bodies, and, um, the after, whatever it is, the, uh, the, the, the weird, uh, soul-like thing that Shimada eats, you know, that's bound to end up, you know, after, after, uh, the body is destroyed or whatever, and the bones come out, and, you know, Shimada gets a little fancy treat, so, yeah, there's definitely a reason for, you know, Shimada to, to tag along. The artificial sun being used to vaporize Zaha and Shimada is close to exploding, since it is only really meant to run for a few seconds in order to dispose of trash. It ran for almost an hour because the luminary of Kanzarn wanted to ensure they're completely done for. Zaha and Shimada are on a ship headed for the holy zone of the Lighthead Order, which is like five planets linked together by a massive light source in a weirdly shaped triangle pattern. The Luminary of Kanzarn wants to report to the Great Luminary so he can get his photo nuclear man body upgrade. It's pretty obvious there is some friction between members of the Lighthead Order, with the Great Luminary being contacted by the President of the Lighthead Order to sow distrust, bringing up that Magma Raiden got a photo nuclear man body before he did. We also see Magma, a.k.a. Adam Warlock, and his grandson Hinata Bogo, who is like a weird shadow blob after having had all the bones in his body removed by Zaha. I don't think we've been shown this yet. While all this is going on, Avakian, Nagarun, and Hajime Damemaru mount a rescue mission. Nagarun frees Hajime from the jar his head was contained in, and since he's essentially immortal, he regenerates immediately. They're still on Kanzarn, but looking to make their way off it. Also, I take back what I said before about Shimada not caring for anyone, or at least partly take it back. When we meet back up with Shimada, Zaha's back is almost completely destroyed exposing his spine and rib bones. The artificial sun has done a number on Zaha, bringing him to the brink of death. However, Shimada remembers that Avakian had asked them to take care of Zaha, and so Shimada does, enveloping Zaha, protecting him from the artificial sun. When the luminary of Kenzarn's cronies dig through the photothon walls, which are impenetrable by all other than Shimada death, they find a black lump like coal and cart it off. This is seen by Magma Raiden, who asks the Luminary of Kanzarn what they're up to, and the Luminary tells him the remains are a gift for the Great Luminary. Magma doesn't like this, and further doesn't like that the Luminary of Kanzarn claims he will be made into a photonuclear man, just like magma. So he starts choking the luminary to death. 
Before he can kill him though, a hybrid of both Shimada Death and Zaha Sanko comes alive, calling itself Sanko Death. And I'll be honest, the art for this scene is legitimately terrifying. One thing that I love about Kyu Hayashi the, as a creator is her ability to just tell an absolutely insane story. Like, you've got Doro Hidoro, which I have up there. You can kind of see my Doro Hidoro volumes up there. Kyu Hayashi the, pretty much, like, I have a long history with being a huge fan of Kyu Hayashi the. I used to read her, I used to read uh, Doro Hidoro when I worked at this, this job where I worked at night. I would, like, just sit there and read Doro Hidoro on this app and I'd like just fell in love with the world and I started collecting it at some point, you know, but I started like from volume 11. That's how far I'd read in, you know, while using this app and I didn't want to start all the way back over. Like I just wanted to continue on from where I left off, you know, while reading it on the app and you know, just, I read up to like volume 16 from 11 and for whatever reason, I never read past volume 16 and I still, this day, I still haven't finished, uh, and I do want to go back and reread the whole thing and I do kind of want to do it for like videos or whatever do like let's reviews for Doro Hidoro at some point in time so that's definitely a dream that I've had for a while and like I did do a let's talk about Doro Hidoro a really long time ago uh, this channel had a different incarnation where like I was kind of like a reaction channel I didn't like it you know so I cut that part out of it but I was kind of like a reaction channel, but at the same time, like I would talk about different things. And one of the things that I talked about was Doro Hedoro. And I still have a screen, which I'll put right here. A thumbnail, you know, from what video that I had done about Doro Hedoro forever ago. But um, one thing that I like, a big thing I should say that I like about Kyu Hayashida is her world building. You know, like Doro Hedoro had this incredible world where, you know, the people live in this place called Hole and Hole is just this awful society, I guess, if you will, where, like, you never know when, when, um, sorcerers are going to attack and essentially try to, you know, make you a victim, and Kaiman, who is one of the characters in, in Doro Hedoro, is a victim of, like, a sorcery or whatever, and he was a human being who was fused with, an, like, a crocodile or whatever, he has, like, a crocodile head, and, you know, like, that, that story has its own thing, you know, where there's, like, the world of the sorcerers, there's the world of, you know, just regular people, and then there's, like, this whole outer layer with devils, and as a human being, you can become a devil, and there's, like, a lot of, like, you know, politics or whatever that, that make that world work and make sense, and... Die Dark is kind of the same thing, where, like, in the beginning, and I've talked about this in some of my older videos, Die Dark kind of exists in its own sphere, you know, it exists in its own world, and the elements of Die Dark, you know, make sense, you know, within this construct, and, you know, you have all these different elements, like, you have Misatani, you have her shop, you've got a vacuum, the dark hides, the paggies, and whatnot, like, uh, Nagarun, you know, in a vacuum, and whatnot, these paggies that have, like, kind of, like, a sense of humanity, and Nagarun more so has, like, some sort of sense of something where, like, you're pretty certain Nagarun isn't just, like, a paggy. Like, there's something more going on with Nagarun. And he even speaks at some point, you know, which, like, makes the mystery even, even wilder. And I kind of like, you know, that sort of a thing. I like that this sets up this world and it has these rules by which it plays and it definitely feels legit. You know, you have the Sigic Order, the Lighthead Order, uh, Photosphere. You have all these different sects and whatnot in these different planets like Kenzarn and then they're going to the Lighthead Order Sanctuary or planet or whatever or like that that triangle thing and there's so much you know that goes on and one of my favorite things Magma Raiden squares off against Sanko Death a new hybrid being of incredible strength it's pretty clear right off the bat that he's no match for this abomination consider what you're about to do Paul Atreides Silence! and declares to flee and warn Big Sparkles, but Sanko Death throws a conehead skull at him and pierces through his midsection, stopping him in his tracks. At the same time, Big Sparkles unveils his latest creation before luminaries from across the galaxy, the second photonuclear man, Hinata Bogo. 
Hinata is reborn and given a new name, Sea of Fire Ver, and is one of the most grotesque looking things I think I've ever seen. He gives Justin Long in Tusk a run for his money. He looks like something you'd fight in a Souls game or in the second half of Lies of P. After all this time, Hinata or Sea of Fire Ver finally is reunited with his worst enemy, Zaha Sanko. We then go back in time two years to Zaha's graduation from the Leviathan class elementary school ship, the Tree Gun. Each student is responsible for making their own way via spaceship from the Tree Gun onto a planet called Sudarchi, where the graduation ceremony will be held. MX Photolium praises Zaha's ship, which I guess is an early design for the Moja. Shimada Death makes a crude, rudimentary ship that they created in one night and uses something called a dark core, a mass of dark energy, which is like a black sphere to upgrade it further. It reminded me so much of Nibbler's Poop from Futurama, which also serves as spaceship fuel. Hinata and his friends have ships that look like pylons from StarCraft II. They didn't even make them at all and had their rich parents buy them. Hinata plans to finally kill Zaha and has a photothon bomb that he plans to plant on Zaha's ship. When he takes off, it'll explode. Shimada realizes what's going on and gets Zaha involved who then catches Hinata in the act of trying to plant the bomb on his ship. To keep it from exploding and taking out all the carefully crafted ships, Zaha uses his dark hide and envelops it as it blows. He is left severely injured, flesh ripped off his bones. Gravely upset about what Hinata did, he calls for a vacuum to give him his dark flesh and immediately materializes an axe which he uses to cave in Hinata's skull and strip his body of all its bones. Yeah, you know, like, Hinata Bogo definitely deserved, as I said earlier, you know, Hinata, Bur Hinata Bogo definitely deserved, you know, what was coming to him. And this volume, I think, so far has been possibly my favorite volume of Die Dark. Because it's, to me, it feels like it's really been the darkest. And I wrote a ton, you know, like, I don't think I've written this much yet while talking about Die Dark, where I wrote, here, I'll show you what, what I wrote, you know, because I want you all to, to see how much, how much, uh, text I have here. Like, I wrote literally, like, what, how many is this, three? I wrote, like, five pages. I wanted to show you all, like, I wrote literally, like, five pages worth of text just so you can see that like this isn't all just completely me you know going off the cuff i actually do write quite a bit when i do these videos i do a ton of writing and to some extent it is you know kind of me just like riffing but a lot of it also is you know stuff that i wrote down so that i wouldn't forget it and when i talk about the series you know i could kind of give you a better than like me sitting here and going um what happened again you know and at least i can give you a more concise you know explanation of certain elements and you know recall and say the thing that that had happened and the exact name of the thing that had happened so to me this has been so far the best volume of the series because i would mentioned earlier too you know from when it started and i talked about this in some of my earlier videos that i did about die dark it felt like a story about nothing kind of like seinfeld but as it's gotten going you know and as the elements have started to come into play more of the like side stuff it's become an incredible story in my opinion i don't know if you all feel the same or if you still feel like it's just like kind of like a goofy story that doesn't really go anywhere and doesn't really lead to anything. Having finished up their business on Kenzarn, Hajime Damimaru, Nagarun, and Avakian plan to go find and rescue Zaha. Hajime also downloaded all the files on the planet that he could, gaining him applause from Avakian and Moja. He then again asks to be referred to as Hellmaster, 
which is always hilarious because no one does. Back on the holy zone of the Lighthead Order, we get the reason why Big Sparkles needs Zaha Sankos' bones. He wants to bring the luminous progenitor back from Photosphere. He figures now that he has Magma Raiden and Sea of Fire Ver at his side, they should be able to overtake Zaha with ease. However, that plan falls apart quickly. Magma Raiden is cut in half and has his arms ripped off by Sanko Death and is killed on the spot, leaving his bones and a huge monstrous flesh, which is what Shimada eats. However, as Sanko Death, it doesn't taste like anything. So Shimada frees themselves from Zaha, leaving him defenseless against Sea of Fire Ver, his backbones still exposed. Shimada then feasts on the monstrous flesh way up in the air, which leaves Zaha zero defensive cover. Two years after having had his bones removed by Zaha, we have the reunion Hinata has dreamed of which I initially didn't think was going to go his way at all. However, the reverse is true, and he puts the whooping on Zaha, who is currently still too weakened from the artificial sunbeam attack on Kenzarn to fight back. Zaha is being battered and not likely to survive much longer. All the while, Shimada munches away on the monstrous flesh, like nothing. Even as Zaha pleads for help, Shimada brushes it away, saying they'll help after they've finished their meal. I feel like this volume so far has had the most moving parts, given we also have the Great Luminary and the Luminary of Kanzarn making their way to the Lighthead Order's base to save Big Sparkles after the Luminary of Kanzarn's significant screw-up in bringing Shimada, Death, and Zaha still alive to their leader, Big Sparkles. What makes it funny, though, is the look of glee on Big Sparkles' face as everything is going on. Even as Magma Raiden gets eviscerated, he has a look of pure awe on his face. Sea of Fire Ver lays an absolute smackdown on Zaha and even removes one of his bones, which he decides he wants to use to get his old human body back. This doesn't sit right with Big Sparkles though, who demands he hand it over. Big Sparkles wants to use it to bring the Luminous Progenitor back, after all. I feel like the best example I have to, this, to, to kind of, you know, mash it with would be to talk about something like Guardians of the Galaxy. I think Guardians of the Galaxy is probably like the most, uh, the closest thing that I could think of to describe this as, or to like, yeah, why not, you know, to, to, com to compare it to, I think it would be that, but this is like a way more messed up, like, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy on meth, you know, sort of a story. I mean, it does feel like a space adventure, you know, it feels like a space adventure with this kid who's just trying to live his life, he's just trying to, you know, have a good time, he wants to hang out with Avakian and with Shima the Death and, you know, basically live his life, but everywhere he goes, he's got that thing on his shoulders about his bones, and I think in the next volume, in volume 7, we're going to get the reason why people think his bones are, you know, magical or whatever, and that they can use them for some kind of advantage we're gonna knock the rest of this video out and i got more to say about this volume before we completely close it out and i hope that you have enjoyed our time together because i definitely have this is a solid volume i think i honestly think this may have just been my favorite volume so far because it feels like everything is starting to come to a head you know we finally got the sheet we finally got the uh the senko and uh hinato bogo like the zaha senko hinato bogo um reunion and it's extremely violent and brutal and it's not even over like there's still another part that's going to come up we're still in the same you know fight and we're going to be in the same fight going into volume seven so it feels like there's definitely kind of like some kind of closure coming and then we'll probably start up a whole nother arc of the series 
but I don't know, I guess we'll see, and let's uh, close this video out, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the, uh, the voiceover and panels that I'm going to show you all. If you've enjoyed our time together, please consider subbing to the channel, leaving this a like, or even commenting. So yeah, let's knock the rest of this video out. As punishment, he zaps Sea of Fire Ver with the energy of Zolar itself. We've seen this name mentioned in Volume 5 as well, where Hellmaster mentions he decrypted info from a file titled Zolar on a drive the Lighthead Order had in their possession. He had also found a heap of info on Zaha, and this was before they ever even met. The Moja arrives just in the nick of time to save Zaha, but not before Sea of Fire Ver gets the wishbone he's so proud to hold. Avrakian hits Sea of Fire Ver with a fire attack, but instead of weakening him, it strengthens him, and he gets a Dark Souls boss like second stronger phase. Sea of Fire Ver melts the flesh off Hellmaster with his own fire attack. Misatani is also there because. Why not? Just bring everyone along. She is there for a reason though. To sell them new weapons or equipment on the spot to continue the fight. Shimada continues being absolutely zero help, even having forgotten all about Saha and his dilemma of being near death. Big Sparkles finally comes by the wishbone, and we get a cliffhanger of Zaha beginning to say, Come, Darkhide. And then the main story chapter ends. We do get some bonus bone stuff, but that's just extra material and inconsequential to the main story. This manga has really evolved from a story about characters goofing around in outer space to a pretty solid action adventure series with great and memorable characters on both sides. Can't wait to see what shenanigans we encounter in volume 7.